segment where the board gets together and we talk about our wins. And it's the victories that come about in the house. And sometimes those victories are small. Sometimes they are just somebody being able to sleep through the night without a light bulb on. Some people, it's just a matter of, I didn't have a nightmare last night. Some people, it's just a matter of celebrating the very first birthday party they've ever had at age 27. It's small victories, but it's also major victories. And I'm here to tell you that I have witnessed women turn around. God has the ability to heal the most broken, the most powerless, and the most damaged among us. And I think there is so much joy in that fact that we need to celebrate as Christians. Which sort of leads me into the message today, and it's entitled, The Unknown God. And I'm here to tell you, sometimes when I read my Bible, I read about people doing stuff and saying things, and I go, what are they saying? What did they, do? what were they thinking? And the scripture we're gonna look at today, I kinda caught myself doing that with Paul. But in 51 AD, some 20 years after Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection, Paul finds himself in Athens. And Athens at the time was a pretty well-to-do place. It's in Greece. And the Greeks were known for their philosophy, for their theology. They had all sorts of great ideas, some of them more accurate than others, some of them not so much. But the group just loved to sit around and talk and philosophize and just talk about life in general. And they also had tons of idols. In fact, there was literally a whole wall of idols. So you could find a God to worship, no matter who you were or what you were. And Paul noticed in this whole wall of idols, one idol that was titled the unknown God. And Paul thought, you know what, I can use that. And we're going to study that scripture right now. Uh, Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. Now, while Paul was walk, waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw a city full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be preaching a foreign divinities because he's preaching about Jesus and his resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Apocryphus, which you would know more familiar now as Mars Hill, saying, may we know what this new teaching that is that you're presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling and hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Apocryphus, said, Men of Antheans, I perceive that you in every way are very religious. For as I passed and I observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind the breath and everything in it. He made from every man, every nation and mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined an allotted periods of the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, perhaps feel their way through towards him, and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live much, we live and more have our being, as even some of you poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed in the art or imagination of a man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man 
whom he has appointed. And this he has given assurance to all rising from him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear about this again. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed. And among them were Diphinius and a woman named Demarius, the others with them. Now I will tell you that had I been with Paul that day, and he proceeded to tell them that he worshipped one of their idols, I would have said, I think Paul's been in the sun too long. Let's get him in the shade. He needs to be cooled off. He's not thinking clearly. I would not have probably gone that route. But the more I look at it, the more I read this scripture, the more I see the method behind Paul's madness, if you will. Paul was speaking to them on a level that they would understand. On a level that they might learn to accept. I am sure that each and every one of you have at least once in your life been told that you were wrong. Maybe more than once, I don't know. But if you look back at that experience and you remember how you took it, most often it wasn't, oh, you're absolutely right, I am wrong. The first part is, no, I'm not. And then I want to argue with you. And in some cases, I not only want to argue with you, but I want to end the conversation and not have a conversation anymore with you. Because you're telling me I'm wrong. Paul understood that philosophy, and he understood that if he just came in and told these people, you're a bunch of idol-worshipping idiots, and you need to straighten out because God is going to judge you, that very few, if any, were going to hear that message and be receptive. It reminds me of a true story back in 1981. In Minnesota, a man's car was stolen. And he instantly went to the police to report the stolen car. And he says, you have to get this out on the radio. This stolen car has a box of crackers on the front seat. And that crackers are laced with poison because I use them to poison rats. So if this thief gets hungry and eats one of these crackers, he's going to die. So radio stations all over Minnesota and Iowa, I understand, in 81, broadcast this message. If you are the thief that stole the car, don't eat the crackers. The irony was they were trying to protect a criminal. They were trying to protect him against himself and rescue him. In a very similar way, God does the same for you and I. God did not save you because you were good. He did not save you because... You seem like nice people. He did not give you salvation because you earned a certain level and said, okay, they're acceptable now. God says they're sinners, they're lost, and they need a Savior. And therefore, I will go and I will die for them. I will take their penalty. And like I said, with Paul starts talking to these Athenians and starts talking about an unknown God... I think what he understood was these are a peculiar people who are going to need a peculiar message. And like I said, at first glance, I would probably have questioned whether he was using the right things. And part of me would want to sit there and clarify to these people, look at this wall of idols that you have. Do you people not realize that's wood and stone? You do not have gods. You have idols. And I would want to try and logically argue with them that this was wrong. Instead, Paul took one of those idols that they called the unknown God and decided to say, you know what? You made an idol for a God that it doesn't need an idol. You made an image of a God that is bigger than an image. And by therefore doing these Athenians are going, he's not talking about a new God, even though they realized everything he was saying was new to them. They'd never heard about the resurrection. They'd never heard the name of Jesus. And by sharing it in that way, Paul was able to tell them the message of Jesus Christ, the message of salvation. And I would suggest to you that they were receptive because of that. Because he didn't first come out and say, look, you morons, 
you're all too stupid to understand that this is wood and stone and I have the true God. That wouldn't have gone over well. It wouldn't have gone over well with me. I know it wouldn't go over well with you and it wouldn't have gone over well with them. Instead, Paul came at them with a little softer approach. He took the image of an unknown God and he says, I serve that God, the one you don't know. And the truth of the matter was what Paul said was not a lie. It is so much to the world today that does not know God. You do not tell people about God from why they need to change. You do not tell God of people that need salvation because they're worthless, rotten people. If you do that, I'm here to tell you, you're not going to have a receptive argument. They're going to get upset with you quickly. And rightfully so. Now today, that would probably resonate with some modern preachers who say, you're right, don't ever tell people they're wrong. Don't ever tell people that there's nothing wrong about what they're doing. Don't tell them that they need to repent. Just tell them they're good people and the good people do nice things and nice people go to heaven. And end of story. Well, there's a problem with that because Paul, in telling these Athenians, made it clear. There was a time of ignorance that God allowed. But now that Jesus Christ is here, it's time for you to not be ignorant anymore. It's time to say, look, there are things that are wrong. There are ways of worshiping God that are not good. And to be truthful with you, in today's world, that's the most unpopular message you're going to hear or speak. To tell people that they will not be in heaven simply by trying to be nice people is going to hurt a lot of people's feelings. I hate to tell you this, but there are nice people going to hell. That makes you sound terrible. It certainly does. It's not what the world wants to hear. I am not saved because I'm nice. I try to be nice because I'm saved, but I am saved because Jesus Christ loved me enough to die for me with my sins. We are saved by grace and by love of God, not by being good enough, not by being nice. And the world today would tell you, if you want to get along with folks, just don't tell them what they're doing is wrong. Don't argue with them that what is sin for you is sin for them. Don't tell them the truth that the Bible says about many things in this world. Because if you tell them that truth, they're not going to like you and they're not going to accept you. And I'm here to tell you, and I've said this before and I can't say it enough, loving someone else never involves condoning wrong behavior. I have known parents who have drug addicts for children who said, because I love them, I keep giving them more money for drugs. And I'm saying that is not a loving thing to do. Yes, I know it feels like love, but it's not loving. You're hurting and destroying that child because you condoning something you know is destructive to them. We as Christians live in a world that tells us many things are good and acceptable, that many things are right when we know they're not. And for us as Christians to say, okay, it's right for you, but it's wrong for me, but you know, we'll just agree to disagree, is a little bit like giving that money to the drug addict and saying, you know, I don't do drugs, but if that's your life, hey, here's more money for drugs. It's not a loving thing. It's not a good thing. And Paul never ever in this verse suggests that we condone bad behavior. In fact, he does challenge the Anthians by telling them, your time of ignorance is over. You're hearing about Jesus Christ and at this point, you're going to be judged because you've heard the truth and you're either going to follow that truth or you're not. 
When we look at a world today that tells you that disagreeing creates division, and let's face it, where can you go today where you don't find division? For those of you who are on Facebook, it is the most divisive place on earth. There's a whistleblower that says that was intentional. The more division they can sow, the more ads they sell. So guess what? The guy that's making Facebook realized that if I can stir things up and get people arguing, more people look at my ads. This world is built on division. And as Christians, you're in a world that frankly is to tell the world the truth. And we have to be careful because it, it's real easy as a Christian to go into the unsaved world and unlike Paul, say, look you schmucks, you're sinners. You're going to die. You're sinning. What you're doing is going to destroy you and have them turn you completely off. Because, like I said, no one likes being told that they were wrong. If, however, you develop an attitude of love, if you try to identify with them, as Paul did, by taking the unknown idol and saying, look, you talk about an unknown God. I happen to worship a God that you don't know. So we're going to draw from that idol, and I'm going to tell you the truth about that God. And some of you are going to reject it, and some did. But some of them did accept it. And that's the problem with Christianity today, my friends, is you'd like for everybody that you tell about Jesus Christ to know and accept and acknowledge Jesus. And the reality is that's not going to happen. Not everyone you share Jesus with is going to say, yeah, I agree with you. And that's hard sometimes. People don't like being told no. You don't like being called names because you disagree with them. But we as Christians need to speak that message all the more clearly so that the ones who do follow can be saved. Paul's writing here in Acts says that several people came to Christ from that speech that he gave. Now, out of a hundred and some people that were there, you might look at the percentages and say, well, he didn't do so hot. And that may be true. God never deals in percentages. God never deals with numbers. He deals with the hearts of man. He deals with you and me touching the lives of another human being. And we come into that with an attitude of humbleness when we talk to people. There's a story about a little boy who was the son of a king. And he burst into the throne room and jumped through the crowd of guards and was singing and dancing. And one of the guards grabbed him and says, look, son, you're in the presence of the king. Show some respect. Show some dignity. And the little boy jerked away from him, ran up and jumped on his dad's lap. And he says, he may be your king, but he's my father. Now, the truth of the matter is, we Christians would like to be like that. I'm forgiven. I see sin and I see it's wrong. I see the parts of the people's lives out there that are a mess. And trust me, you don't have to look hard in this world to find people that are really messed up. I mean, it doesn't take long to talk to people and just say, wow, this world is a mess. But what that story reminds me is, I cannot be like that little boy on his dad's lap. While I do see a world full of sinners, I have to remind myself, that I too was a sinner. I too was flawed. Before Jesus Christ changed my heart, I too was just as messed up as the worst person out there. You know, I've said it in Bible study a couple times and I've had a couple people raise eyebrows when I said it, but I said, when it comes right down to it and we're at the judgment day, Adolf Hitler and I will have the same judgment with one exception, Jesus Christ has forgiven me. 
Now, some of you will say, no, 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 no. You never were as bad as Adolf Hitler. You've never committed mass murder. You've never done. But the Bible tells me that if I sin in the smallest way, if I'm angry with my brother, I have committed murder. And my friends, there's not a single one of us that can stand before God and say, nope, I never did that, Lord. We're all sinners. We're all flawed. And we all deserve the damnation of hell as much as Adolf Hitler does. The only difference, the only thing that changes us is that gospel of Jesus Christ, of knowing that we are a child of God, that we can come before him. Paul's message is a message that needs to be told to this world today. I have never seen a world more in search of an unknown God than they are today. If you listen to some of the crazy ideas, and I hate to say this, but some of those crazy ideas are coming from pulpits. You have to be careful some of the pulpits that you listen to because there are some really bad theologies out there. And there are people that will tell you, you'll make it to heaven without Jesus Christ. Don't you worry. And I'm here to say you didn't read your Bible because John says there is only one way to the Father and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus' own words said that. That's not just the Gospel of John. It's not just a Bible that was written thousands of years ago and is no longer relevant. That is Jesus Christ's own words. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now either Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or he was the Lord of the world. We all have to make that decision. We all have to make that resolution. But today, the world is in search of a way home more than they have ever been. And I'm here to tell you, they're not going to hear that message by going to a wall of idols that you can find on any TV show, that you can find in any news media, that you can find through any other source. They're not going to hear about Jesus Christ except through Christians whose lives have been changed. So my friends, we are the Paul of today. We can neither be condemning, neither can we be condoning. I can sit and look at a world and say, I, I deplore the life you live. Like that drug addict example I used before, I don't like seeing people destroy their lives with drugs. But I have to admit, if I'm honest, I was destroying my life with sin before that. It was Jesus Christ who changed that. It was Jesus Christ who can change them. So I cannot condemn them, but neither can I condone them. To live in a world today that lives in sin, that tells you that you can get to heaven in another way other than Jesus Christ. My friends, you do no one a service by saying, oh, I agree with that. That sounds like an easy, you know, maybe it'd be simpler if we just all believe that instead of saying Jesus Christ is the only way. It is unfortunate, my friends, that there are not 20 ways to heaven. It is unfortunate that there is only one way of salvation, and that comes through Jesus Christ and his death on a cross and our accepting that death. We are in a message that is desperately needed to be heard today. We are in a time where people need to hear about Jesus Christ more than ever before. The question is, if you do only wait for the pastor to tell them that, the pastor is only going to get to so many people. You need to understand, you need to grasp that we are, as Christians, called to tell people about Jesus Christ. We are called to tell the world about a hope that they do not have. We're here to tell them about an unknown God 
that they cannot grasp and they cannot understand. But because we have had the blessing of the Bible and someone else revealing to us about that loving God, you and I have the ability to share that with someone else. And we should. Because it is that unknown God to this world that will make the difference between whether they go to heaven or whether they go to hell. And my friends, there are people out there that don't like other people. And that's unfortunate. It's always going to be the case. But I'm here to tell you that there is no one who sees hell for what it really is that could ever wish anyone going to hell. No matter how bad you may despise someone, the horrors of hell should overwhelm you to a point where you say, I still desire to see that person come to Christ. I still desire that they do not go to hell. We are the Paul of our generation. We will either speak to the people and tell them the truth, or we will stay silent and watch them go to hell. And I do believe, unfortunately, Far too many people who sit in churches today are very content to be very quiet and not speak out. And I think it's time for us as Christians to say, there is good news, and I know what it is, and share that good news with others. Thank you.